Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I do want to start by saying uh, a huge thank you to Miss Fernandez in the background for dancing along with me at that epic introduction music. It's very rare when people do that, so thank you. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Happy April, everybody. Happy April Fool's Day. Uh, we did a light march with only 35 live broadcasts or so, uh, and we decided to just you know, reject that and dive in headlong in a crazy April coming up. Many of our teachers joining may know that we just released our epic program series in both official languages in Canada with Parks Canada and the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. So it's going to be an epic tour coast to coast across Canada virtual field trip series. So hopefully you guys can register and join for that as well. We're diving in today with one of our favorite speakers and one of our favorite topics here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We're going to learn about all the amazing work being done in community conservation in Madagascar by Dr. James Ferreira. So he's at the Duke Lemur Center in North Carolina. They have partnered with us on, I think, 30 broadcasts over the last year. It's always such a treat to hear about lemur conservation and all the work being done in one of the most interesting and unique places on this planet. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to James. Thank you so much for joining us, man, and take us away. Thank you, Jesse, and just making sure you can see my uh, presentation. You see everything all right? We are all set to go. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining me. I'm really excited to be able to uh, participate in another exploring talk. And uh, I'm really excited about this topic because it's something that hopefully each and every one of us, uh, you know, attending this presentation and each, of, each and every one of us on the globe can not only relate to, but participate in ourselves. So I'm gonna talk about Madagascar's new decade of ecosystem restoration because it's not just Madagascar, it's the whole world. Um, so then the United Nations, which is an organization that re with representatives from all around the world, has deemed uh, 2021 to 2030 the decade of ecosystem restoration. And the reason is we as a, a global community have really 30 years left to achieve a number of goals that we have set for ourselves as a global community to improve not only uh, the natural environment, but also human livelihoods. And they're called the Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations. And there's 17 of them. I'm going to talk a little bit more about them specifically in a second. But these were initiated in the early 2000s because we realized that um, there were a number of environmental and social issues that really needed to be fixed to improve uh, our future and the sustainability of our uh, species. And it turns out now in 2020, after years of striving towards these goals, we're not on target. Target. We are really far off target for most of our goals. And so we really need to push hard now and to be motivated to achieve these goals. Well, there's 17 of them and they're all really important. I don't have time to go into each and every one of them today. I'm going to focus on just a few and how I kind of use this framework as a way of thinking about the Duke Lemur Center's conservation projects in Madagascar. So I'm going to start with, you know, these, this is not an order of importance or anything like that. You know, we can, we can spin it a lot of different ways and think about how all these different goals are connected in a lot of different ways. But I'm going to start by talking about goal 15, which is life on land, to protect, restore, and uh, sustainably manage natural environments on land, especially forests. We're going to talk about forests today, but it applies to all terrestrial ecosystems. And I see this as fundamentally tied to goal two, which is zero hunger, to have uh, nutritious and sustainable food for all. Um, goal three is clearly linked to having uh, nutritious food is good health and well-being. Uh, and then, of course, goal one, no poverty. So these are goals that are intimately connected. I think we could all get behind these, uh, these goals kind of at this higher level and say, yeah, we all want for everyone to have access to enough money to live a happy, safe, li and healthy life, to have enough uh, natural resources and food and things like that. And underlying all of these goals is goal five, gender equality, because we can't really achieve any of these other goals without gender equality. And there's you know, lots of other ways that these other goals are interrelated, but we just don't have time for that today. So starting with goal five, uh, excuse me, 15, life on land, um, we know that, you know, humans are having an increasing and negative impact on the natural world. Um, urban sprawl for bigger and bigger uh, city populations is one aspect, and feeding all those people in the cities is, is a big part of it. 
Um, but we also know that, you know, deforestation generally, it has many different causes all around the world. So in North America and Europe, for example, a lot of it is for forestry. People are growing forests and, and using forests to, to deliver timber. There's also increasing amounts of wildfires all around the world. In other parts of the world, like in Latin America and in Southeast Asia, it's commodity driven. So what does that mean? Commodity driven means like uh, large scale agriculture for cash crops like oil palm. Uh, oil palm is especially big in the Southeast Asian areas and, you know, for example, soy or cattle pasture in, in Latin America. Also a lot of other crops that we can kind of go on and on. But we're converting, you know, we as a global community are converting these natural environments, especially diverse rainforests, into these monocultures or these single species agricultural systems that are really one of the main drivers of deforestation globally. Returning to this map, though, we're going to talk more about Madagascar, which is part of Africa. We can see that in Africa, most of the deforestation is due to shifting agriculture. And we're going to talk about that more in a moment, but that's really more smallholder farmers, people, individual farmers who have, you know, maybe two, five uh, acres of land, and they're trying to grow enough food for their families. So we're going to talk about Madagascar. It's this big island off the southeast coast of Africa. Here I'm showing in green the forest cover based on satellite imagery from you know, recent times. And the white area is non-forest. So that can include like agricultural areas, but also grasslands. And there's a lot of debate over how much of the grasslands are natural versus, you know, growing from, it used to be forest and then it was deforested and now you just have grass. So a lot of debate about that, but focusing in on the forest and what we do know uh, at least since, you know, the 1950s, we know that there's been about 45% of the forest that was lost. So that's a lot. And we need to think about how that affects the biodiversity. So the, D the Duke Lemur Center has all our conservation programs here in the Northeast. It's uh, in the Sava region, which is an acronym for the four cities in the area, the Sambava, Andapa, Voimar, and Antala. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. But of course, we're at the Duke Lemur Center uh, presentation. We have to talk a little bit about lemurs. Uh, they are the primates that are endemic to Madagascar. They are only found there. There's about 100 different species, ranging from the small nocturnal species, like the mouse lemurs and dwarf lemurs, um, you know, some of the uh, larger but still nocturnal species here. And then we've got a lot of diurnal or day active species that are uh, very diverse in all their niches. Uh, some of them are eating fruits and leaves. Others eat bamboo, like pandas. So they're really, really fascinating. They're charismatic, which makes them a good flagship species. That means that they kind of represent the overall biodiversity, kind of like tigers and pandas uh, represent their ecosystems. And by striving to protect them, we are also protecting the other biodiversity, which doesn't get as much credit. Uh, for example, it's estimated that there's probably like 100,000 species of insects, at least 1,000 species of ants alone, 300 species of butterflies. Uh, there's around 400 species of each amphibians and reptiles, um, you know, 260 some odd species of birds, at least 100 other mammals besides lemurs, including these things that look like hedgehogs, but they're actually more closely related to elephants than they are to hedgehogs carnivores that look like a cross between a cat and a dog, but they're actually more like a ferret. So it's just really amazing biodiversity in these forests. And a lot of that biodiversity, especially the lemurs, is threatened with extinction, meaning that um, there are a lot of different pressures on the, the wildlife that make them at risk of going extinct in the near future, within the next few decades. Uh, for you know, many of these species, the predominant threat is habitat loss. So if we zoom in and we're looking at the Sava region of Northeast Madagascar here highlighted in red, um, starting in the 1950s, we had aerial photos, people flying over in planes, taking pictures that give us an idea of what the forest cover was like at that time. And so here I'm showing in green, you know, the estimate of the forest cover at that time. Fast forward to 1970 and we can already start to see these forests um, contracting and, and a lot of forest loss. And there's a lot of social and political things that are going on at this time that we don't have time to get into right now um, that caused this. 1990, we still see a lot of this deforestation and it's really starting in, at this period that we have a lot more conservation initiatives, creating protected areas, for example, that most of the remaining forest that we see today is actually inside of different kinds of protected areas like parks and reserves. Um, and so, you know, 
this loss of biodiversity and this um, conversion of forest to agriculture and other areas, it's very closely tied to the goal two, which is zero hunger. And we can't really um, forget that this deforestation is, especially in Madagascar, it's not like the giant oil palm plantations. It's largely local farmers who are trying to uh, uh, make a, a living and they're trying to make enough food to survive. And this is a common theme around the world. So 690 million people worldwide are chronically hungry. Two billion don't have regular access to safe and nutritious food. And in Madagascar, there's about 26-ish million people. The country is the size of about France or the state of Texas. So it's a pretty big island. 80% uh, of this population is living in the rural countryside and 70% live below the international poverty line, which is about $2 per day. So this is very tight, tightly correlated with uh, patterns of hunger. So surveys have been done all over Madagascar demonstrating that over 50% of people are considered chronically hungry. Um, in 2020, there has been a famine in Southern Madagascar that's affecting 1.3 million people. Uh, and this is part of a, a longer trend. This is not something new, but it is part of droughts and things that are uh, increasing. And again, these, you know, again, speaking in Madagascar, a lot of the people that we're talking about are these farmers out in the countryside. So they are subsistence farmers, meaning they're trying to grow food for their family and maybe they have a little extra to sell at markets. Their staple crops are rice, like here in this picture, but there's also some beans scattered around with them, some corn growing into. Um, and the predominant or traditional method of agriculture is what I referred to earlier as shifting agriculture. So that means that farmers are shifting, moving around the landscape. And it starts with uh, basically cutting and burning vegetation, which it could be, you know, just kind of bushes and grasses, or it might even be forest. They cut it and uh, after the vegetation has dried, they burn it because the ash and char will uh, boost the fertility in the soil real quickly. It also kills off weeds and insect pests and it's a low tech, um, low input method that has been used around the world for you know, thousands and thousands of years. And it can be sustainable when uh, there's a lot of land and there's a small population, but usually, you know, and like I mentioned, they're, they're growing their staple crops like rice, corn, cassava, beans. Um, but as I was mentioning, it can be sustainable, but what we often see in these landscapes is something like this, where it's this kind of patchwork of you know, here we've got some recent uh, areas that were burned. This light green is kind of regrowth and bush in between being used. Down in the lowlands, you'll have these active areas of flooded rice fields. And then you'll see these little forest fragments dotting the landscape. But then up here at the top of the hill, this tree line is, is actually the border of a national park. So in a lot of areas where there are no national parks, what we see is this deforestation continues to the point that there really is no forest left. The soil is very degraded and it's low fertility. It often just gives up and erodes in these big erosion gullies. These trees that you see are mostly uh, introduced pine and eucalyptus that can grow fast on these degraded soils, but they're not you know, native. They're not the, the diversity that we usually see. So again, this is closely tied to goal three, which is good health and well-being for all people at all ages. Multiple dimensions of wellness, obviously, from the physical spiritual, emotional, and others, I'm gonna focus mostly on nutritional health as it's correlated to, to the goal of zero hunger. So in Madagascar, 48% of people are considered underweight and 36% of women of reproductive age roughly are considered anemic, which means they don't get enough iron and, and nutrition in their diet to produce enough hemoglobin, which brings the oxygen to your body and keeps you strong and this has negative effects on the mother, women, but also on their, uh, their children. So these are issues that are also closely tied to poverty. So Madagascar is one of the top 10 poorest countries in the world. Um, and like I said, 70% of people living below the poverty line. In this graph, uh, what it's showing is called the gross domestic product or GDP. And that's a really rough measure of economy in different governments in different countries. And so what we're seeing is on the y-axis, if it's uh, you know, above zero, it means the economy is growing, it's improving. And if it's below zero, it's declining. And so in the early 2000s, we were seeing some pretty steady economic uh, increases 
until 2009 when there was a political coup d'etat, a military takeover, and the economy crashed. And it slowly has been rebounding since then until 2020 when we've had this coronavirus pandemic, which um, luckily the virus hasn't caused widespread disease like we had really feared initially. And um, there's a lot more we can talk about related to that, but the country has been pretty much closed to the outside ever since. And um, markets were closed. There's a lot of um, confinements that are being, uh, you know, just like we're seeing around the world. So those have had really negative effects on the economy. I'm gonna talk about vanilla for just a second because believe it or not, 50 to 80% of the world's vanilla comes from Madagascar. And not only that, it comes specifically from the Saba region of Madagascar. So think about that next time you're having your vanilla ice cream. And uh, vanilla has been an economic engine for the Saba region because it brings in a lot of money. There's so few places that produce such high quality vanilla that there's a lot of demand and a small supply, and that means the price can go up. So since the early, you know, late 1990s and into the early 2000s, you know, vanilla prices fluctuated, but they were overall pretty low. In 2003 and four, there was this spike related to uh, a lot of different factors that drove high prices. A lot of people got rich really fast, um, but then there was this drop in the prices again. And it, you know, slowly has roller coastered again back up to uh, higher prices in the late 2000s, uh, excuse me, 2010s. But guess what? This volatile or unpredictable market did it again. And so last year the price plummeted. And because of the many factors related to this, it's probably going to be very low again next year. So it's not a very reliable uh, source of, of income, but it is one of many tools that the farmers can use in their kit to diversify their income and, and buffer themselves a little bit from um, all the different pressures that they're facing. Tourism is similarly like a really important part of Madagascar's economy. In fact, five to eight percent of the overall economy was driven by uh, international tourism and, and domestic tourism as well. In fact, almost nine hundred million dollars uh, was generated just in 2018 alone. Here I'm showing, you know, millions of U.S. dollars on the Y uh, axis and uh, on the X axis is time. And we don't have the numbers yet, but because Madagascar has been closed to most of the outside world for this whole year, uh, we know from reports all around the island, hotels and restaurants are really suffering. They're closing shop. You know, guide associations that depended on tourists are, are really hurting. They're really suffering. And so, again, tourism is great. It can be a really important economic engine, but we know it's also volatile. So how do we achieve these uh, really ambitious, big, broad goals uh, the sustainable development goals. Well, I like to think of it as, um, you know, agroecology is one of many different tools we can use in our kit to address a lot of these different goals. Now, agroecology, I've talked about it in a lot of my other presentations, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I, can, I like to consider it like a, a fusion of farming and natural processes. It's, uh, it's about finding nature-based solutions to our problems but it also integrates cultural resources, social justice, uh, features that are related to all the other goals we were talking about, not just farming, farming methods, let's say. So I like to summarize it in this one slide. And again, I've done this on a lot of other presentations, so I'm gonna do it real quickly here. But if you're interested, check out some of those other presentations. But basically mother nature has figured out solutions to just about any problem we can come up with for the last three and a half billion years. And plants do so much work for the environment, for the ecosystem that humans benefit from. They do these services for free for us. And so we need to think about how we can live in a sustainable way that we can harness these natural processes sustainably to, to, to survive. So these, especially th thinking about trees with their deep roots that, that are covered in bacteria and fungi that feed the soil food web under our feet they are turning inorganic minerals, like literally rocks and pebbles and sand, they're turning that into organic materials that can be taken up by life and plants especially to put it into their biomass, into their organic stuff like leaves and stems. And when those leaves and stems fall, we can gather them and we can make mulch and compost that return those minerals, return that fertility to the soil 
and improve our crops like corn, cassava, and beans that we were talking about. We don't need the inorganic uh, and often toxic fertilizers. Um, another example is shade. So, you know, just uh, helping to decrease temperatures locally, that's an, an increased humidity locally, that's really important. But many of our cash crops like coffee, cacao, cloves, vanilla, they are naturally understory plants that grow better in shade. So they will uh, actually do a lot better in the, in, in the forest. Um, and then we can also think about how we can attract and promote the beneficial biodiversity that's doing all this work for us. So we're talking about pest control, like the uh, hawks and, and owls and snakes that eat the rat pests and the amphibians and reptiles that eat the insect pests and the birds and bees and other butterfly pollinators. We need these back on our farms to, to get the, the natural system working. So the Duke Lemur Center has a lot of these kinds of uh, programs and, and, and philosophies um, tied into our programs to teach and foster exchange about agroecology. And uh, we've got over 150 farmers that are involved in this program with about eight different villages. It involves a lot of training, but also exchange to learn from local communities as well in diversified sustainable agriculture. And we also partner very closely with the local university, CURSA, which I've, I've talked about previously as well, and you're gonna hear more about them today. There's 10 university students at least who are involved regularly in our programs, as well as uh, professors and even the director. So what does it take to really do this restoration on the landscape? How can we improve agriculture? How can we make more food and do it sustainably? Well, it really takes people power. So here's just some of the team. This includes some of the uh, university students as well as local farmers. And, you know, trees need soil. We've got to make a tree nursery so we can grow these seedlings to distribute. So the team, you know, works together to gather the soil and of all different kinds of soil and sand because you got to mix them together to get the right uh, composition for to promote really healthy growth. And it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of dirt, <laughs> soil preferably, good healthy soil, not just um, degraded dirt. And it takes a lot of hands to fill the pots where we can actually, um, you know, grow these seedlings. And, you know, just in one, in one go, this team was able to fill 8,000 pots and then fill those pots with the seeds. And here you can see cacao seeds in just different stages of germination. You know, it's no trivial matter getting good quality seeds and making sure that they're uh, grown properly in these nurseries. Here in this right-hand picture are, are more of those cacao. The local community told us they're really interested in cacao agriculture. It's not very common in this region, so they might have a unique uh, business niche as well. But we're growing uh, native trees with the communities as well, as pictured um, in this back row. And also fruit trees. So here's one of my favorites, avocado. It's also one of the local community's favorites, and it's a really nutrient-dense fruit. So it's a it's great to have this mix. Um, and we're fostering exchange among a lot of different actors. So here's Michelle, uh, Bas Michelle Basinia, who is an agroforestry specialist, and he's demonstrating how to tell which of these coffee seedlings is ready to be planted. And here's uh, the director of the university and one of the students demonstrating how to properly plant and maintain these seedlings, uh, adding compost and things to the, to the hole so that these seedlings have a really good chance of survival. And we've got this demonstration plot at the schools where we work, uh, where we've, uh, you know, this particular area I forgot to mention is a partnership with a local school. And so we like to partner with the schools because it's an opportunity also for education, for the kids to be involved. Um, and so over 4,000 seedlings have been distributed as part of this program to 50 of the participants. It's a really great start. I mean, that's just this year uh, and we're only in March. And we'll continue to, to serve this community through these uh, partnerships. But, you know, we're talking about a country the size of Texas or France. <laughs> um, and we're talking about uh, millions of people. So how do we scale this kind of activity up to have a, a bigger impact? Well, we've got to have more partnerships. And so here again, uh, CURSA has been a really amazing partner to have through all these programs. Um, they actually have their own piece of land, which they want to use to create a demonstration food forest. We like to call it a food forest because it's a forest 
full of all different kinds of food, obviously. <laughs> so jackfruit, mangoes, soursop, if you've ever heard of that one, that's another one of my favorites. Um, papayas, lychees, every, basically any kind of fruit you can think of grows in Madagascar. And that, that's what they're planting. Not only fruits, but also um, moringa. If anybody in the audience has heard of moringa, it's like a big fad these days in Western cultures. You'll find in moringa powder in health food stores. Um, it's a tree that the leaves are very high in protein and iron, and it's locally one of the favorite foods. So we can plant these trees that people can harvest. And again, it's not just about sticking seedlings in the dirt. We're making compost, or I should say the local communities are, are the ones doing all the hard work. They're, they're making all this compost to enrich the soil. You can see these are big planting pits to fill with organic matter. Another one of our partners, which is actually a, a new collaboration that was a little surprising at first is with a local branch of the military. So the military has this land that they were given by the government, which they can use however they want. And they tried to do some agriculture on it, but it's, it's one of these places where agriculture has been done for probably a century. And a lot of the soil is very degraded. So they weren't, it wasn't really productive. So they decided they wanted to do reforestation. So we, they came and we discussed how we might uh, support their endeavors. And uh, just uh, since, you know, February, they have planted 20,000 plus seedlings on about 20 hectares of land. That's almost 50 acres and uh, 14 or 15 different species that they're planting. And uh, it's also, it's not just the military, it's all the communities bordering this piece of land that get involved. Uh, so you can see these events can get really big and it's an opportunity for everybody in the community to be a part of it. School kids come out to, to participate. The local branch of the Ministry of Environment uh, and, and Matt and Olivia here uh, in, in this picture, you know, thousands of seedlings that took a lot of uh, effort. These were contributed by nurseries from all over the region. It wasn't easy work, you know, we needed a lot of people to help and, and they had to ford rivers just to get to the site. And it's not just about seedlings of forest trees, you know, and growing forest for forest sake, it's agroforestry. So the people have a productive benefit from having these environments. So they're also planting things like bananas and uh, pineapples and other fruit trees that we talked about. And not only are these providing a short term crop, but they're also providing the shade for the seedlings. So yeah, the, a lot of different benefits. Um, if you've tuned into some other Madagascar talks by like Travis Stevens and, and colleagues, uh, you've probably heard about fires in Madagascar and, and how we can protect land from fire. Here they're doing what's called a fire break that you may have already heard about, where you've got to clear the vegetation around the perimeter of these areas so that if a fire, you know, if there's a neighbor on uh, uh, who's, you know, using fire to clear their land, that fire isn't going to jump over into their land. So this is a massive amount of work to like really clear and protect this area. Just really briefly with a couple of minutes left, I'm not going to be able to do it justice, but like I mentioned, gender equality is fundamental to all these goals. So I want to focus in especially about uh, agriculture in Africa. You know, women represent more than 50% of the agricultural workforce in sub-Saharan Africa, and yet they make up less than 15% of landholders, landowners. You know, officially the title usually goes to a, a husband in the family and women don't have access to land ownership. They also rarely have access to educational opportunities or subsidies, loans, and things like that. So there is this huge disparity, this huge difference in how benefits are distributed to people. And there's a lot of things tied up in that. And that's one of the things we're really trying to uh, understand and overcome. So one way we're doing that is through developing a women's farming association. It's led by women, it's entirely uh, attended by women, and the, the local farmers themselves are the leaders, as well as the university students pictured here who do a lot of interviews and focus groups with the communities to understand the challenges they face and the solutions that they can find. And so they're making, uh, you know, uh, gardens, uh, small home gardens, they're teaching about sustainable farming techniques, how to make the compost that we talked about, how to plant diverse and nutrient dense vegetables like beans and greens. And then, you know, planting all these things is great, but what do, you, what do we do with these plants once we have them? Well, a lot of the people want to be able to sell their crops to make some money. 
but it's also important to understand how you know creating these diverse uh, gardens can also diversify home diets. And so here is Nestorine, who is uh, also a, a faculty at the university. She's got a background in nutrition, and she comes out to talk about nutrition and what she calls sakafu maruluku, uh, food of many colors. And that's a way of, of talking about diversifying the diet and thinking about how plants, uh, vegetables, and, and fruits of all different colors have different micronutrients, different vitamins that they provide. And so just by diversifying the colors in the diet, we can also diversify the nutritional quality. And there are no shortages of fruits and vegetables in, in these markets, but it's a problem of access. Many people just don't have the money to buy them, so we, we really wanna encourage growing them. And here, uh, Nestorine also teaches about proper hygiene, uh, treating the water, which is often coming from rivers and wells and needs to be treated, and, and other hygienic practices. And of course, then they have these big picnic lunches where everybody gets to enjoy the food they made. So I'm just gonna wrap up by saying how, you know, through our conservation projects in Madagascar, we're really trying to focus on the overlap of biodiversity conservation, global health issues like nutrition, and always taking it from a place-based approach, meaning it's, it's community-driven, it's specific to these local settings because everywhere is a little different and they face different challenges and we have to be flexible and adapt. And that's how we hope to be able to achieve these sustainable development goals. But this is not just about us in Madagascar, this is about every single one of us uh, on the planet. So everybody can and should get involved. You can make your own garden in your front yard. You can um, you know, leave some of those weeds that are growing in the front yard for the bees and pollinators. Plant some trees in your own your backyard or with your own community. Join the movement now. Why? Because we really have to. We have 10 years to try to achieve these goals and this has to be the generation that does it. So join the Generation Restoration. And with that, I just wanna thank our partners through at Duke Lemur Center. I'm, I'm running out of time and I wanna take questions. So just wanna flip through all the amazing folks at DLC, at CURSA, uh, some of the students, of course, the local community members and our, our sponsors and people like uh, you all that are watching this presentation. And if you're interested, share this widely, share our, our website and all of our uh, projects come from grants and donations. So from viewers like you. Thank you very much. James, that was fantastic, man. Thank you so, so much again. And if you want to come out of screen share so you can see us, we can have a bit of a conversation, that would be great. We're going to dive in with questions. If you're on YouTube and you want to share, we've got groups around the world, so please do share in the chat bar. And Ms. Fernandez, Ms. Acosta, uh, Ms. Fernandez will be able to come live to you. Ms. Acosta, share in the chat as well. I really want to highlight that I'm so glad you mentioned at the end of the garden a little bit wild. This is something that a lot of our teachers are curious about. We talk about cool. all here a lot. Um, and so how do you get bees? How do you get those native pollinators? And bee scientists universally will say, leave a few of those dandelions, leave a bit of uh, rape in the corner of your lawn to provide crucial food and habitat for some species. So sort of a, an interesting segue there, but I, I love that you brought that up. That's great. Um, James, let's dive in. I'm gonna start with Ms. Fernandez. She's joining us live in Brampton, down the street from here in Toronto. Uh, come on in and take us away. Hi, Hi, Dr. Herrera. Thank you so Hi. much for sharing about Madagascar because my grade eights seem to have a fascination. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, we're all good. Oh, they're saying we're muted here. Sorry about that. But thank you for that because my grade is really fascinated with Madagascar. Now, one of the questions they were asking is, is the damage to the environment, and I believe that was 45% damage to the forest that you were talking about, is this reversible in our lifetime? And when I say our lifetime, I'm referring to the 13-year-olds. So they want to know if it's reversible and also what efforts have been made to um, have like reforestation happening. Great. Yeah, it can sometimes feel really like a doom and gloom. We, we often say like, oh, you know, all the rainforests are disappearing and it's so sad. But yes, I do think that we have the ability to restore a lot of these landscapes within our lifetime, sometimes within decades. So a lot of research has been coming out very recently that shows natural regeneration in some of these tropical habitats can occur within just 20 years such that you're restoring um, what, you know, what we can call forests. So you've got tall trees, you've got a closed canopy. It's not, you know, the, the pristine forests that, you know, are like thousands of years old, like you see in the Amazon or Congo. Um, it's, they're, they're still, you know, recovering, 
but that's already providing a lot of the ecosystem services people need, like uh, keeping the soils strong so that they are not eroding and they uh, soak up water to allow uh, water to, to stay in the system longer and not just run off. So yes, within 20 years, which means if they plant tons of trees right around the schoolyard now and they come back when their kids are to school maybe, they'll see forests, they'll see trees growing all around. I mean, there's plenty of examples from all around the world of people who have restored their own land in a, in a time that they can see uh, you know, the change themselves. So what can we do exactly uh, like, you know, maybe as a group, as a class, you, you can think about how we can plant some trees in different parts of the schoolyard. You know, maybe there's a plant sale where kids can bring things home. Uh, if you want to help out with Madagascar, I mean, we're always looking for volunteers in lots of different ways. Obviously, now with the pandemic, that's going to, we have to talk about, you can't necessarily get to Madagascar now, but there's lots that can be done to promote what we're doing. And once, you know, once things open up again in Madagascar, um, you know, there's, there's going to be more opportunities to travel there and to learn more firsthand. But as you can see, you know, Malagasy people are really taking charge and, and doing what needs to be done to restore these landscapes because it is it is their land it is their heritage that they're trying to protect so so ha you know i don't want it all to sound doom and gloom there's a lot of great uh things happening all around the world yeah and you you absolutely didn't sound doom and gloom i think that it's such an important message to share with families and teachers that there's so much that can be done in a fairly short timeline and in madagascar especially one thing that's nice miss fernandez that i loved when i had the chance to go to madagascar is you know, James highlighted this, this poverty element that Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world, which does present some challenges, but it also means that money there goes so much further in helping, you know, achieve conservation ends. If you want to train a ranger, if you want to create a fire break, that stuff that's way less expensive in Madagascar than it would be in say, Canada or the U.S. So I really think there's a lot of really neat potential there. I'll make sure to bring up some links at the end as well. Um, and two quick notes. If you want to see conservation in action where we've restored an ecosystem and led to some amazing stuff, the Pristine Seas Initiative is an oceanic one and is incredible for all our teachers. And for you, Mr. Hernandez specifically, Sudbury, four hours north of us uh, in Brampton and Toronto, we have a program with Franco Mariotti. Uh, it's on our YouTube channel. It's incredible to see what can be done in a 40-year timeline. Unbelievable stuff. So we check that out. Uh, James, we've got, we've got a question from Libby joining us in Auburn, Alabama. She wants to know, how many times have you been to Madagascar? How long were you there? <laughs> Did you make any friends with people while you were there? <laughs> Um, I, I, I did, I think I, I've been there seven different trips at this point. The longest I've stayed was a year and a half. Um, and usually I, you know, with my current job, that was when I was doing my PhD research, um, which, you know, during, when you're doing a PhD, you have to come up with this whole research project. And, you know, mine was about lemur ecology. And so I spent a lot of time out in the forest. So some of the best, you know, years of my, of my research were there in Madagascar. Um, and usually with my position now at the DLC, I should be there nine months out of the year, but because of COVID, I have been here in, at Duke's uh, for the last year, but really hoping that I can return soon. Oh, and about friends. I mean, that's one of the things that kind of got me hooked to Madagascar. Um, it was really hard for me at first, especially as Jesse mentioned, uh, you know, the poverty is extremely challenging and it was a little bit heartbreaking. And at first I was like, I don't know if I can do this, but I made so many close friends with people that um, allowed me to see so much about the culture that is really beautiful and really, even when they are um, so poor by like international standards, they are so happy and uh, they have so much wealth in terms of many different dimensions besides just how much money they have at hand. And that was one of the things that really got me hooked. I just said, this is an amazing culture. And, and I have my friends like Sidera, Tanzana, um, Fuljan, Christoph, so many to thank. I, I shouldn't have started because I don't want to leave everybody out, but so many people who have really made me realize how amazing Madagascar is. George, Lydia, I'll stop, Tommy. No, that's totally <laughs> So you've highlighted in some of your other presentations before the full list of all those amazing people that you've collaborated with. And that's not even a full list. I mean, this is the thing that we hear from speakers all over the world is that when you go to these places, you know, first of all, you're the guest, you're the visitor. Uh, none of this work would be possible without the support of local communities and the leadership of local communities. And Madagascar, I mean, I'll never go as much as James went, but you've never met more generous people in your entire life on this planet. It's quite astonishing um, to see and a really, really amazing experience for anyone who ever gets the chance to go in person. 
Um, James, Laura's in on our chat. She's answering questions as usual. So thank you to Laura for doing that. Uh, she's awesome. I want to share a few quick questions um, on our chat and then go to Ms. Fernandez to wrap up in a minute. So Ms. Acosta joining us in Washington State. Her class wants to know what universities in the U.S. are you guys partnering with? Is it like just Duke? Is it other places across the country? Great. Yeah, there's many universities that are engaged with uh, research in Madagascar. Uh, I, I couldn't do justice to the list, um, but there are, there are many and we do partner with a lot of them uh, in some respects. Uh, and in others, you know, everybody just has their independent projects all around. So it's so it's great that there is so much interest because it can diversify and spread across Madagascar. It's a very big country. But I'll just name a few off the top of my head that are really uh, doing amazing work in Madagascar. Stony Brook University, they've got um, Pat Wright and uh, the Centro Valbio Research Station down in Ranamafan. Um, you know, that's, that's of course, that's where I did my PhD, so I know a lot about their initiatives. Uh, there's also Washi uh, WashU, Washington University. Um, places like in California, there's a lot of universities. Uh, you see uh, San Diego and um, Davis and uh, Berkeley, who has now uh, Unzo is a professor there. She's a Malagasy scientist who's now at Berkeley, and that's going to really ramp up their um, commitment to Madagascar. Uh, I'm probably leaving out so many. Harvard University um, has Chris Golden, who's doing really great work there. So I'll stop there. <laughs> well, I love it. Sorry, it's so funny because you keep getting the questions like, "Who are your friends?" It's like, well, I have 193, so it's tricky. Um, no, that's a great job. And I mean, you did highlight it in your last slide there some of the amazing partners you guys have. If you guys check out the website uh, at lumer.duke.edu, you can see some of the amazing partners that they've worked with over the last years. A uh, just really incredible series of programs. So do check out our YouTube channel as well for those. Uh, Miss Fernandez, I'm going to wrap up with you. Time flies, and you're having fun, people. Holy! Um, come on back in and, and share another question with us. If we are lucky enough to travel to Madagascar um, sometime soon, would we be able to visit the Duke Lemur Center? And also, how can we support the center from this side of the world? Yeah, you would be able to visit um, our headquarters. Uh, you know, as, as, as um, with all the things I told you about, you, you might be surprised to learn that we're actually a really small organization. We've got a little headquarters in Sambava, the main city in that region, and we have our project coordinator, Wantu Anjian Anjasana, who's based there in Sambava. We've got uh, a, a new uh, member of our team, uh, Evrard Benesovina. And so there's, we're, we're really a small organization on our own. It's through our partnerships that we can um, do so much. And so, yeah, if, if, if anybody wanted to come and actually Duke hosts uh, the, uh, it's a tour to Madagascar. It's called the alumni tour, but it's actually quite open uh, to, I think anybody can register. Um, sorry to my uh, supervisor, Charlie Welsh, if I'm wrong about that. But so there's a there's a Duke led tour of Madagascar that they sometimes go to this area. Sava is a little bit difficult because it's pretty remote. You've actually got to take an extra flight to get there or you drive on a road that can take anywhere up to two weeks because <laughs> the road's so bad. Um, but yeah, if you were to visit, um, you know, members of our group would be happy to host and show you around all the different parks and projects and how to support uh, Duke from here in the United States. Yeah, as Jesse, I appreciate Jesse showing the website, lemur.duke.edu. Check out what we've got on the website and um, you know, people have a lot of different interests. So there's the Adopt a Lemur program where you can support the lemurs that are here at, on the Duke campus you may have already heard about. There's other projects that are going on in Madagascar. You know, lots of different things that you could support either via donations or if you just want to write to us and say, hey, we really loved what you showed. We'd like to volunteer. We're interested in X, Y, Z, and we can find a way to make you fit. Fantastic. And I mean, one thing, Ms. Fernandez, as well as, of course, there's the Madagascar element to it. There's also North Carolina, so a lot more accessible to us here in Ontario when the world opens up a little more. And they've got fantastic things to check out. I mean, including all their, their lemur forest. A lemur forest in North Carolina is as magical to me and now as it was when I first found out about it a couple of years ago. So uh, do check out those resources. Their website is amazing. And I also wanted to bring up one last time. Uh, James shared this youthenvironment.org slash restoration decade. There's so much amazing work being done by the UN on the sustainable development goals and more. So I'd encourage all our classes tuning in to check it out. James, this has been so much fun, man. Uh, I really appreciate you sitting down with us today and telling us this amazing story. It's so neat every single time. It's been my pleasure. Thank you all for joining me and for your excellent questions. I really always appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all. So enjoy the rest of your day. Awesome. Have a nice day.